Thank you for joining us for today's message. We believe we can go anywhere in the world from right here in Lamarck, Texas and reach people just like you. If you'd like more information about Abundant Life, please visit ALCC.org. You can also text the number below if you would like to support the church financially. Be ready for a powerful message that's gonna impact your life. It's a fascinating thing that takes place with the uh, uh, prophet Elisha when Elisha goes and he sees uh, a woman from Shunam and he has ministered uh, to her and her husband and the scripture says ultimately that she has a child even though she was on up in age, her husband was up in age and uh, they have a child, that's what she had desired in her life. She had built a room, uh, her and her husband had built a room on the side of her house. The scripture says for uh, the man of God, for Elisha, I called it uh, preparing a place for the move of God in your house. Everyone ought to uh, make sure that your household is ready to receive a move of God and give God all of the glory. Amen? Amen. The scripture says Elisha and Gehazi the servant had passed by there on a regular basis and one day she understood that the man of God was passing by but he wasn't stopping at her house. Other people were getting blessed but why wasn't she? So she talked to her husband and she said, let's build a, a, a room, let's build a place so when the man of God comes this way, uh, he doesn't have to go and, and pay for a hotel room somewhere or whatever, but he can stay here at our house. And the scripture says in the, in the story that that's what took place and Elisha did that and uh, she put uh, uh, furniture in there, she put a light, she put a chair, of course a bed, uh, she put all of these things in there for him, a table, and there he could um, uh, eat and he could relax and he could pray, he could do what he needed to do while he was on his journey. Well, uh, one day uh, he had this great urge to just bless that family because of their kindness. And the scripture says, uh, the, the lady said, well, uh, don't play games with me on this because there's only one thing really I want. Because the scripture says she was a wealthy woman, she was rich. It's amazing how many women in the Bible, when you read about them, are rich. Yeah, as many, uh, as many women in the Bible that you read about uh, are wealthy people. Uh, I just thought I'd say that. So the next time you think, well, the, God's not equal, uh, just remember, uh, proportionally there's more wealthy women than there are wealthy men named in the Bible. just thought I'd mention that. Somebody shout hallelujah to that. All the men say, oh, shucks. Come on. <laughs> and... Uh, Maybe it's because they manage the money better than the men. I don't know. I'm just saying. But um, so then, of course, uh, her and her husband conceive in their old age, and they have a son. One day, the Bible says uh, they're out, and as they're out um, working in the field, the father and the son, uh, the son has something like a heat stroke, and the Scripture says uh, we'll pick it up right there. And that's where we'll begin this particular teaching for a moment today. Are you all ready? 2 Kings chapter 4. Hang on just one second. Verse 18. 2 Kings 4, 18. So it fell on a day when the child was grown uh, that he went out to his father, with his father, uh, to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And uh, he, uh, so the father said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. I've always enjoyed this particular passage. Carry him to his mother. I don't know why daddy didn't do it. Maybe daddy thought he was just faking it. He starts saying, because they're out in the field working. And the boy starts saying, My head hurts, my head hurts. And he grabs his head. And the father says to one of the other workers, take him to his mother. I don't want to go there, Lord. <laughs> and when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon, and then he died. Oh, wow. I can't imagine what must have been in that father's mind when he got that news. And he died, the Scripture says. Well... Verse 21 says, 
So she took him, she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. So they had built a room for him. And some of you have read this story, if you know it. Uh, the scripture says she takes the boy and she puts him on that bed that she had made for the man of God. And then the scripture says she went out. And she called unto her husband and she said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the donkeys, one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore will you go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. I, I just think it's interesting that she never told him that, that your son died. Maybe she just didn't want a lot of unbelief around. Uh, I, I'm going to assume she's not angry at him. She's not acting like an angry person. But she obviously had spiritual perception because when the man of God was passing by their house years before, as the man of God was passing by, she said, I perceive that this is a man of God who passes by our house. She had a perception. She had a knowing. She had an unction in her spirit. Uh, have, you, have you ever, does anybody know what I'm talking about, that unction from the Holy Ghost? She had an awareness. My experience has been that almost always, I can't say 100%, but always, uh, it seems like almost always, that unction that I first get regarding something is generally the right direction. Amen. It's the right thing. I may not understand everything, but uh, whether it's uh, good or bad, or if it's just something that's normal in life. But when you, when you get an unction, it's almost like the Holy Spirit has given you some kind of a category uh, of good or bad or just normal or something. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. How many of you glad the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you? You've got the Word and the Spirit. You don't have to know everything about everything. You can just know if something is actually positive or negative. If it's good or bad. You just give yourself a little while. You'll know a little bit more about it. Sometimes I hear about movies that come out and people are talking about them a little bit. And the Holy Spirit will give me an unction like that's not one you really need to put your kids in right there. You don't need to go to that one. Uh, or maybe there are things that are going on in life. Sometimes it could be food. How many of you know that if they offer you some kind of grilled bat that you ought not eat it? Come on, does this take deep perception? Leave the puppies and the cats alone. All over the world, people do that. Right now, it apparently is loose some kind of virus that, that uh, they're having to deal with. Now, they're feverishly working to, to get the uh, antidote for it right now, and they'll do that, of course. It's just a matter of time. But still, that came from eating, they say, it came from eating food that the Bible emphatically says, do not eat this kind of food. It's all over the, uh, the Old Testament, do not eat uh, your pets. Thank you. You know, you really don't have to be a spiritual giant to know that. Verse 23. Gosh, didn't we just learn something? Isn't that awesome? And verse 23 says, her husband said, why are you going to do this? Why are you going to do it? It's not, it's not the Sabbath, and it's not one of the holy days. So why are you doing, why are you going to see the man of God? And she just said, all is well. Everybody shout, all is well. All is well. Have you ever had something in your spirit that's really important to you? And you, you, you know you've got to guard who you talk to about it? Yes. And it may be something that's really pressing on you. But just because you're going through an issue of some kind doesn't mean you need to tell everybody about it. Yes. Sometimes if you say, well, I trust God, well, don't go into this huge description of how bad your situation is. And I'm not minimizing your situation, but how you manage it in faith is real important. And so you don't have to deny that there's something coming against you, but you should be able to rise up in Jesus' name. And when you do speak about it, you speak to it in the name of the Lord. There is a right way and a wrong way to talk about situations. And if you believe that God is ultimately going to 
uh, you'll see the victory in it, then you understand there is a process many times getting to that victory. And if you're in the process of faith, you can say, all is well. All is well. And you're saying to yourself, well, the answer hadn't manifested yet, but I'm in the track right now that's going to get that answer in Jesus' name. So I'm doing right. All is well. Come on, shout all is well. And so this woman is doing something that we see in the scriptures that God captures for us to understand how to talk about things on the worst day of your life. It couldn't have been much worse for this mother uh, than this particular moment. But she apparently had overcome the, had overcome the, what I like to call the gift of panic and hysteria. And she stayed calm and she controlled herself. Who she talked about at that moment and how she talked about it at that moment. And she must have continued to say that to herself to get her to this point. If God gave him to us, God can somehow raise him up. Verse 24, so she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. I like this. Drive like Pastor Hallam. Slack not your riding for me unless I tell you to, except I bid you. Give it, give the gas to the, to the feed that donkey two extra uh, ears of corn. So she went and came to the man of God to Mount Carmel. Y'all remember Mount Carmel? And it came to pass when the man of God saw her way off, afar off, that he said to his uh, unbelieving servant Gehazi, behold, yonder is that Shudamite woman. Look, way down there, that's that Shudamite woman. Uh, run to her, I pray, meet her and say unto her, is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? And she answered, say it out loud, it is well. Now, I, I think we can agree that in the natural, things were going bad. But she had a purpose. She had a direction. Uh, she obviously had an unction or a word from God in her spirit that she needed to go where the answer was, not just where she can vent in her, in her fear, in her hysteria, in her own panic. She's overcoming that with all is well. All is well. She's keeping it under control. All is well. All the enemy's trying to do is get her off of her faith. All is well. It is well, she said. So when she came to Elisha, to the man of God, to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to knock her off of him, to thrust her away. And the man of God said, leave her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me and hath not told me what her problem is. I think that's powerful that he had, first of all, the perception that obviously this woman just wasn't a, a groupie who's out trying to get close to him. She's bitter in her soul. She's very uh, vexed, King James says. She's grieving in her soul. And she doesn't know how to respond in this because she's never been in this circumstance before. She doesn't know how to react. And so she makes a decision that she's going to react as much in control and saying the right things uh, as long as she can possibly do that until she gets someone who can get in agreement with her some way or she believes can pray with her. And the scripture says, and the Lord hid it from me, uh, Elisha says, and I don't know what the problem is. Then she said, did I desire a son? Did not say that, my Lord? Did I not say, don't deceive me, don't let me have him and take him away? And so she's talking to this man of God. Then the man of God said to Gehazi, the servant, gird up your loins, put on your coat, take, your, take my staff in your hand and go. Uh, go that direction where that boy is. If you meet any man, this is your assignment. Go thy way. This is the way, your assignment. If you meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute you, answer him not. Don't get distracted 
from doing the will of God. When you start uh, to go do the will of God, you can be sure your adversary will give you every excuse. And some of those excuses may even be real. But when you know you're going to obey God, you've stopped doing some things or you've begun to do some things. The enemy will try to get you off of that track every time. Somebody shout amen. amen. Uh, there will always be excuses to detour on the path of God. No, you just stick with the plan of God. I said stick with the plan of God. We go to church on Sundays. Have you ever noticed how many opportunities there are to not go to church on Sunday? When the house assembles together, there are a thousand excuses. And sometimes those excuses come because of people. And so always judge yourself in those areas, examine yourself, and make sure that you are being faithful in that track that God has placed you on. Because you never know when one word from God or one one. A uh, uh, move of the Holy Spirit in your life at that moment can change everything. Right. And God has a plan, and it is a process. It is, it is developing, it is evolving. God's plan is in your life. Uh, I can tell you right now, 35 years ago, if the Lord had told me everything that, that we have done in these first 35 years, Right up front, somebody asked me more than one time, did you see everything that you get to do today? I, I, I said, well, no. If I'd have seen that, I would have never done it. There's just too much. And, and it was way beyond my pay grade, especially in those days. Come on, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. And uh, there's no way I could have done it. It would have totally freaked me out. Uh, but on the other hand, glory to God, uh, we just decided to go that day at a time. Get on the track and go that way in Jesus' name. And we've had many opportunities to get off. But we just made a decision, no, 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 we're going all the way. Amen. Come on, how many of you made that decision? You're going all the way. Come on, all the way in Jesus. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference what the mountain, what the valley, what the river, uh, what the desert looks like, or whether it's a green, lush forest and a huge harvest. Nothing is going to get you off of that track of serving God. Clap your hands to the Lord right there if you've got that. Let that get in your spirit. So Elisha says that to him. Don't miss God. Stay on the track I've called you on. He said, now take my staff, uh, in verse 29, take my staff and lay it upon the face of the child. That's so important to hear this. Let me just tell you this. Gehazi is the servant of Elisha. Elisha was the chief servant of Elijah. So Elijah was the greatest man uh, in anointing in the Old Testament, the Bible says. There's none greater than him, Jesus said. But Elisha had a double anointing. And now Elisha is training up a servant and what are called the sons of the prophets. Uh, he's raising up ministries. And uh, the scripture says, every time Gehazi tried to do something, and there are about a half a dozen times or more in the next couple of chapters, when Gehazi did something that the man of God would tell him to do, that it did not work. It failed. And they, we couldn't figure out why it did for many years where every time uh, he laid the staff on the boy and it didn't do anything. Uh, another time he was supposed to fix a, bottle, a pot of beans and uh, a soup for a bunch of the prophets who had come by. And he just sloughed it off on someone else to do it. He was supposed to be correct toward Naaman who was the, the leper. Y'all know the story. And then at the end of that, we found out what his big problem was. He was full of greed, and he despised the fact that Elisha, uh, that he was serving Elisha, and he thought Elisha was dumb and getting old and could not figure out how he could take Naaman for a lot of money because he had cured him of leprosy. I'd like to tell you that your action can be one thing, but your heart can tell another thing. And so it's very important that you and I always guard our heart, uh, guard your heart toward your spouse, guard your heart toward uh, uh, your, your influence circle, your job, uh, guard your heart toward the house of God, the kingdom of God. We live in a fallen realm. There can be negatives that take place. Guard your heart. Come on, somebody shout all is well. 
Shout it out loud. Come on, guys. Get that in your spirit. If you get that bad report, uh, when you go to your doctor and your doctor says, here, I see this right here and this right here, do not panic. I know those can be distressing moments. Been there, understand it. But that's when you begin to say, well, all is well because I know my Redeemer lives. I know that with His stripes I was healed. And I know God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And so it may not seem uh, possible, certainly not uh, something that I'm asking for, but if I'm going this route, it's going to end up well in Jesus' name. All is well. And so the Bible says, he told him, take my staff. That's a powerful staff right there. That staff is a type of the Word of God. Uh, Moses had a staff and he held it up at Rephidim. He got up there and held it up and as long as that uh, was up high, the Bible says Joshua and the children of Israel had a victory down in the valley. But Moses was old and his hands began to come down in the heat up there on the top of that mountain. So Aaron and Hur, one got on one side and the other got on the other side and they set a rock there and they put him on that rock and they got under there and they just held his arms up. And when they held his arms up, the Bible says God just continually began to flow uh, his victory in the valley for Joshua and the children of Israel. And they destroyed Amalek, the Bible says. And when they destroyed Amalek, then that evening, that's because uh, that rod of God was a type of the Word of God. How many of you think you ought to keep the Word over your life? Come on. Keep that anointing flowing through your life. Then that evening, the Bible says, and this is in Exodus 17, don't turn to it. But even uh, then that evening, uh, when the battle was all over, Joshua, of course, was the male servant of Moses. Joshua's 53 years old at this time. He's not a, not a kid. Moses is 80. And the Bible says he comes in and he's going to uh, uh, give Moses his food and make sure everything's okay. I'm sure he cleaned his sword and, and everything and got it all put up. And the Scripture says... Moses says to Joshua, sit here. God told me to rehearse in your ears what took place today. Because I will have war on Amalek. You were fighting Amalekites. I'll have war on Amalek forever. And so the Bible says Moses sat him down and he said, Joshua, listen, this is what happened. You got down there as a servant. You started fighting. Even though you're not a trained military man, you started fighting. And you notice how it looked like you were going to get defeated. Somebody was about to kill you. And then all of a sudden the battle changed and, and you start fighting like Zorro all of a sudden. And you're, he said, that's because I was up on that hill with the rod of God. And my hand would come down and, and we would start losing the battle. But your brother over here, Aaron and her spiritual brother, they recognized that their part uh, was to hold my hands up. Because God works through things. It's teamwork. Yeah. It's family work. It's body work. Yeah. Uh, and he said, so when everybody was in their place doing their part, the battle became very powerful. So it's not a matter of you down there swinging the sword. You were doing your part. It wasn't a matter of just Aaron in my, on my right side or her on my left side. But it was uh, or, or just me holding that up. But it's the body doing its part and the glory begin to flow through that. That's why when every person does something in the name of Jesus, y'all ought to help me preach this today. When you do something in the name of Jesus, the victory expands and expands. And he said, so rehearse this, which means to say it over and over and over. Joshua didn't know that one day he would be the leader of, uh, of Israel when he turned 93 he became the leader of Israel. He didn't know that. But he did. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if at least once a week from then on, Moses didn't say, do you remember what took place when you, that first battle that you had? That's the template for how God is going to do it. Every person at Abundant Life Christian Center putting their hand to something in Jesus' name, doing their part, and believe in God for the glory of God, the flow of God, the victories of God, and everyone shared in the victory. Amen. There's another great place right there to just take a break and magnify the Lord. Amen. And believe God. Every person has something we can do. I, I believe our greatest assignment is finding God's plan for our life. And the scripture goes on. 
And he said to him, Lay my staff on the face of the child. Verse 30. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. He arose and followed her. I just think that's so powerful. I think that's so powerful. I believe she was actually confessing her faith when she said to him, Do you remember when I said, Don't, uh, don't pray that I get something to get you yanked away from me. Don't deceive me. And you remember when we asked God for that child. So here's the thing, uh, Elijah, Elisha. Uh, my son has died, but God gave me that son, so I'm not going to leave because I believe that son has more to offer than just the short time that he's been alive. Because we prayed that he would not be yanked away from us, and we prayed that God would give him to us, and you're the only person I've been able to get in agreement with, so I'm in agreement and I'm not leaving uh, you and, uh, and Elisha just looked at her and went, oh my goodness, and he just followed her. <laughs> said, take me to him. Yeah. It sounds like the territory for miracles to me. Yeah. And this is Elisha who had more miracles recorded in his ministry uh, in the Old Testament than any other prophet. He said, then just let's go. Everybody shout, let's go. And he arose and followed her. Verse 31, Now Gehazi the servant passed on before them, and he laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet uh, Elisha and told him, The child is not awake. The child is dead. He didn't come back. Now when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead, and laid upon his bed. He went in therefore and shut the door upon just the two of them. And he prayed. Somebody shout prayer. Pray. Come on, shout it out loud. Pray. That's the number one thing. When you're, in, when you're in a spiritual battle, a spiritual conflict, uh, the number one thing is make sure that you pray unto the Lord. Amen. Don't just, just roll up your sleeves and jump in there. Now you're going to have to do something. You will have to do something. But the first thing you need to do is pray. Uh, don't ever forget that. I know we pray all the time, but we, uh, we forget many times when things are not always going the way we want them to, that prayer is the, 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 the next thing or the last thing, something like that. I've had people say more than one, I've heard them say this more than one time, especially, I tried everything and then I turned to God. <laughs> well, how about turn to God and then try everything? Amen. Turn to God first. And then watch how God begins to direct what happens next. And I understand if someone doesn't know the Lord, and if they have the ability and the willingness to just endeavor to get through a difficult situation on their own, look, you have a lot of capacity, you have a lot of ability, and there's a lot of things you can do like that, but there are many things in life you're going to run into that if it hadn't been for the Lord, you'd have never got through it. So it's right to turn to the Lord first. Come on, seek first. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all of these other prayers begin to come to pass. Seek His will first. Hallelujah. And so the Scripture says, He went in therefore, and He shut the door upon the two of them. Then He went up, and He prayed. Now after he prayed, the Bible says, he went up, or one translation says, he went over to where the boy was, and he lay upon the child. And then he put his mouth upon his mouth. Somebody said, was that artificial uh, respiration? No, no, you just stay with me. He put his mouth upon his mouth. He put his eyes upon his eyes. He put his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself, meaning his feet upon his feet. He covered him completely. And the flesh of the child slowly began to warm up. Well, maybe he was warming up because there was uh, somebody up against him. Or maybe the move of God had begun to take place, but it hadn't fully happened yet. Thank God Elisha didn't quit just because his body began to slowly warm up. Because the answer wasn't there yet. 
It hadn't manifested. It was just beginning to manifest. Has anyone ever had God, uh, it seems like, answer your prayer in, in stages? That's why you keep praying. Come on, shout, keep praying. And you pray in faith, because I'm going to tell you, it takes faith to do what this man did. He goes in there, shuts the door on a dead body, and starts praying to God. After he prays for however long, the Bible doesn't say, he goes over and climbs on top of him and lays on top of that corpse, face to face, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes. I like to say ears to ears, hands to hand, feet to feet, heart to heart. He's laying right there. This man is believing God for an answer. And the scripture says, and it begun to take place. He began slowly to get warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro. That would be he prayed again. Then he, he, he said, well, that, that's not the full answer yet. I'm not, I'm not satisfied with 50%. I don't want him to still be on that bed when this is over with, though he may, maybe he would be alive, maybe he wouldn't. His body's beginning to get warm. I want the answer from God. That's what that mother wants is that answer from God. So I'm not going to stop. This is a powerful thing for you and I to understand how we can approach God even in the most extreme situation. And the scripture goes on and says, He returned, walked to and fro in the house. Then he went over and stretched himself upon him again. And then the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. And he called Gehazi, he called his unbelieving servant, and he said, call the mother. So he called her, and when she came in, he said, take up your son. Then she went in, fell at his feet, bowed herself to the ground, took up her son, and went out. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, many historians, the Jewish historians, many of them say, this isn't in the Bible, but according to uh, their history, there is a huge uh, uh, trend where they believe actually that this young boy became Jonah. So maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't know, but you can be sure God's got a plan for his life. Yes. One of the reasons is because he got a praying mama yes. who's not going to stop until the answer takes place. Yes. And he has a mother who knows how to get her son in the anointing. Uh, and because today's not forever when you, when you experience things. And so she's like, all is well. And well means this boy's going to wind up serving God one day, way out, uh, I'll be in heaven, but he's going to be living for God, and I'm going to see to it right now. Listen, it's very important that mothers and fathers train their children to seek God. It's extremely important. I said it's extremely important. I've had people say this to me, and they really have. I've had this more than one time because it's just a cliche in the world. Uh, when when I, I'll say to someone, well, bring your child to church. Look, if you're not going to pursue God really with all your heart, just do your, your role as a mother or a father. Bring your child to church. And then they will say something like, well, when I was a kid growing up, I was forced to go to church. So I'm not going to do that to my child. When they get old enough, they can make that decision themselves. Well, you just made that decision for them. It's the same one that you're living in right now. That child's not going to live for God unless there's an intervention some way and someone goes across their path and they make a decision to seek God. Things change, but thank God it can. Uh, and why is it we do that when it just comes to serving God? I mean, when, you, when your child gets up every day, do you say, do you want to go to school today or not? You can stay home if you want to. Make the choice. I'm not going to make you go to school. Yeah, you should make them go to school. And if you'll present it right, they'll actually get to a place where they like to go to school. As difficult as it believe, is to believe that could actually happen, it can happen. Praise the Lord. And uh, I know when our daughters were growing up, we had a little pat rule in our house that just said, I'm not going to tell you who your friends are. I'm going to tell you who they're not going to be. So you can have all the friends you want, 
But there are some people that are not going to be your friend unless they change. Oh, my goodness, that's good preaching. For such a young preacher. Y'all help me out. Come on. So, no, no. You, everybody's not going to be I'm not talking about acquaintances, but everyone you know and you meet in life. When I was a boy growing up, there were some guys in school that were gangbangers. They were rough. These were some rough motor scooters. And I related to rough motor scooter a lot. Just as a boy. I've got four brothers, and we, you know, we were all tusslers. That's all I'm going to say about that. And uh, you can be sure that if somebody was tough and rugged and defiant and rebellious at school, man, it, it, it appealed to this boy. I mean, there was just something about it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, and that's in, in, in life. I wasn't afraid of those kind of guys. I was somehow I admired their defying uh, spirit. The Bible calls it the spirit of rebellion. And I liked it. And so there's one of them I'm thinking uh, in particular, and he actually was on the football team for a couple of years before his lifestyle got him kicked off, you know. And um, I just thought this guy was the coolest guy in the world. And my father, thank God forevermore, my daddy said, son, look, we, we'll pray for him. If he wants to talk about the Lord, we're there in a moment, but you're not going to hang out with him. Amen. I said, but daddy, you know, he likes me. He said, well, sure he likes you. I'm sure he does. Because you, gotta, you have a car. Amen. Sure he does. You always have, you know, $5 in your pocket. Amen. Sure he likes you. Uh, you. You can drive the getaway car. <laughs> but you're not going to do that. And I'd say, Daddy, you're not trying to get along with me. And he'd say, I didn't raise you to get along with you. I'm raising you to get along without me one day. Right. Totally different. Right. Totally different. And so he kept steering me. I don't care how much I wanted to go the other direction. All right, enough of that. Thank God. Thank God for mothers and fathers who are willing to pursue God and do their very best to make sure something good happens in Jesus' name with their family. So Gehazi gets on top of him the second time after praying, and the Bible says that he sneezed seven times. Achoo! I can only imagine what uh, Elisha must have thought at that moment. I mean, he's on top of him, nose to nose. And all of a sudden, achoo! Achoo! I asked Cindy, uh, yesterday we were talking about this, and I said, honey, why do you think he sneezed seven times? And she said, maybe it was a feather bed. <laughs> that was as good an answer as I had, I don't mind telling you. I said, well, maybe it was a feather bed. I'm not really sure. Because it's the only place in the Bible where anyone sneezed. That we have written in the Bible that anyone sneezed. But yet it's with the man that has more miracles than anyone else, and God recorded it. So it doesn't mean that sneezing is divine. Now, there'd be some trend other than one, one time in the Scripture. But I just begin to look it up. So I look up the word sneeze. And Webster's and all of them uh, and many other uh, dictionaries say it means to, uh, to expel a foreign object that has gotten in the nasal tract that inflames it, tickles it, or causes an obstruction of some kind. And built in you is a natural sneezing reflex to clear the nasal. And you, you do that through your nose and through your mouth in this deep, deep medical uh, history right here. Isn't this great? And some people sneeze and expel more than other people at one time. Come on, cover your mouth, cover your nose. Isn't this a deep, deep message, isn't it? And some people uh, do not expel as much when they do, so they will have multiple sneezes. Have you ever known people that have multiple sneezes? If I ever smell pepper, I don't know what it is about pepper. It doesn't have to be on my food. I can just be sitting at the table with you. And if you, if you just load your stuff down with pepper, just excuse me. <laughs> Something about pepper. I don't know if I'm allergic to it. I like it, but uh, it doesn't seem to like me. But anyway, uh, he sneezed seven times, and then he opened his eyes up. Now, 
God raised him from the dead, and, and all of the wonderful things happened. But God recorded a little of this process so we would understand some things. And so I don't know for sure what all seven reasons or what it was, but all I know is he, uh, the Bible says he had died because of his head, and then he came back alive after seven sneezes. He kind of starts warming up. Sometimes when we start praying uh, and we just start getting a little warm in our spirit, man, watch out because the Holy Ghost may talk to you about some obstructions in your life that need to be removed for you to be able to come alive in the call and the ministry and the purpose and to overcome the attack of the devil. When the Apostle Paul went to Mars Hill, uh, the Scripture says, when he goes to Mars Hill and uh, uh, he begins to preach, he talks about seven things. And those seven things that Paul talks about in the book of Acts chapter uh, 27, when he begins to talk about, the, uh, Acts 17, when he talks about those things, those seven things are the seven major points of all religions. It deals with creation. God created everything, he said. Uh, you and I have a beginning. This earth had a beginning, and the founder and creator of it was Jehovah God. He created it. He separated the, the water. And, the, uh, and so I know there's a lot of theology today, I mean uh, philosophy today, uh, uh, on, on uh, evolution and all of that. And I have no problem with adaptation and the fact that maybe if you put an animal in a certain climate over a period of time, that it will maybe grow a little more hair or it'll adapt a little bit to that. That'll even happen to you. Uh, if that's the case, I need to get where they grow a lot of hair. But anyway, uh, you can adapt a little bit. You can climatize to things. But you're not going to jump genetic links and go from being a human to an animal. Your amoeba is not going to change. It never has. You were made in the image and the likeness of God. So there's a huge difference in those things. And he begins to teach about those things. And he's saying, uh, the, the God that you have an idol to out here, you don't know him. But I want to tell you who he is. Achoo! He's Jehovah God. And he starts telling these seven things like that. He says, God made all men. There's, there's another word right there. God made all men from one blood. Amen. He said God started with one man. His name was Adam. He was the fountain of humanity. God put his uh, own DNA inside of that human and then gave him the ability to multiply. I'm sure some of the philosophers right there, it's freaking them out already. And he's at Mars Hill, which is the top think tank in the world at that time. All the different philosophies are there. And he keeps on going. Men should live righteous under their God. There is a penalty for not obeying God. There is a God to gain. Uh, there is a judgment to come. There, uh, uh, there is a resurrection. And the Bible says when he started talking about the resurrection from the dead, they started laughing at him and threw him out of the place. So he gives these seven major points about heaven. He talks about creation. He talks about God made all men in here from one blood. So whether you like it or not, start liking it. You're kin to the person around you. In a long distance relationship, you are kin to that person. Hallelujah. You never knew you had red-headed and blue-eyed ancestors, did you? But... The ancestor you don't have is an animal. Amen. Hallelujah. Because it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference, my friend. If you get ill and you need blood, you'll find out real quick humans have one blood source. You won't care if it's white blood. You don't care if it's Hispanic blood. You don't care if it's Japanese blood. You don't care if it's black blood. You don't care about it. As long as it's not monkey blood, you're going to do just fine. Because God made all men from one blood. And so he tells these seven things. And I'm saying that for this reason. If you want the move and the power of God in your life, 
Sometimes there are thoughts. He grabbed his head and he said, my head, my head. And later on he died. Sometimes we get ideas, philosophies, thoughts. We get exposed to things in life and they get in our head. And they keep us from serving God and they can absolutely lead to death. They can lead to destruction in our life. But when you get at Abundant Life Christian Center or a Holy Ghost church that teaches the Word of God, something begins to happen and you have the ability and you have the opportunity not to just disbelieve something else, but to fill that void with the Word and the truth of the Word of God. Get your head, your heart filled with the Word of God. Expel some of that other stuff out of you. Expel that abortion justification. Get it out of you. My God, I'm preaching good. Get rid of that poverty mindset. Come on, get that thing out of you. It's a blockage to the spirit and the life of God using you for everything God has for your life. Sneeze it out in the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Fill it with the truth. My head, my head. Well, if your head's the problem, your head's probably the answer too. Instead of your head being struck by the S-U-N, oh, you know where I'm going. Some of y'all way ahead of me. Just let the Word of God, the S-O-N, get in your head and watch what God does in your life. Seven is that number of completion, of entirety. And God is saying, just get all of that stuff out. And I understand it's progressive. But the decision's automatic. The decision's immediate. Where you say, uh, listen, I need the Word of God. I need the staff of God. I need the man of God. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I need that in my dying situation. My money is dying. My family's dying. Uh, my business is dying. My health is dying. Whatever it is, God, let your anointing get on top of me and I will remove some things and replace it with your anointing. Even if it's traditional thought that I've held for many, many years, if it's contrary to the Holy Ghost, sneeze it out. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, expel it, declare it. I will not be involved with hate and prejudice. I don't care who in my family or my circle of influence up till now may have some mindsets. I refuse to embrace that. Are y'all listening to me today? That's what you got to do. You got to expel it and replace it with, we were all made in the likeness and image of God. And God does all things lovely, the Bible says. And so all of the diversity that God has made is actually lovely. And if you're not seeing it that way yet, expel it and embrace what God has said. Listen to me. The first thing the Apostle Paul said at Mars Hill, he said, you're worshiping every kind of God. The God of, of a tree. The God of the owl. The God of the earth. The God of whatever. All of these deities. If you're in India, you've got 360 million gods. A million gods for every day. And without Jesus, you're just 360 on the way to hell. That's all it is. Oh, God. He said, but realize there's a creator. And he's coming back one day. And he begins to reveal those seven points of major doctrine. That Hinduism embraces the concepts. Islam embraces the concepts. And even Christianity. All of them do. From creation to eternity. There's seven things. So I don't know what those seven sneezes were exactly about, except he got his head, his face, his hands, his eyes, his mouth. God, the words I've been speaking that are not right, I'm going to expel them. 
the things I've been listening to that are not right, I'm going to expel them. The things that I've been looking at that are not right, let your anointing fill me. I don't want to sin with my eyes. My hands, Jesus, I want them to be you. My works, my feet, wherever I go, my heart, let it beat for you. I'll get things out of my heart that are not right. Without Jesus, I don't have a chance. But with him, I start getting warm. Come on, we start getting warm. And sometimes you have to go in for a, a, a second dip until you see the answer. And then your purpose comes back online. And God created you for a reason. But you'll have to expel some things to maximize it and embrace other things that come from his kingdom. Did y'all get that today? Did that get in your spirit this morning? Come on, give God the glory today. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you with your daily walk in Christ.